wish I could tell you, wish I could describe it, but I can't contain it, can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture, not enough words to ever say what I found. It's wonderful and powerful and beautiful and glorious, holy is wonderful.
exalt you, O oh God. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his head, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. out. center of it all 
From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus at the center of it all, Jesus at the center of it all, from beginning to the end it will always be it's always been you Jesus Jesus nothing else matters nothing in this world will do Jesus you're the center
desperate and to the defeated, to the common, the average, the plain and the small, I want you to know you matter to God, to the washed up and the worn out, to the helpless and the hopeless, to the cast outs, the dropouts, the last picks and hypocrites, to the unimpressive and the underwhelming, to the nobodies and has-beens, to people just like me. You matter to God. You are not defined by your worst days or your biggest mistakes. And you are not the sum total of all your setbacks, slip ups, failures, and faults. Because who you are is not determined by what you have, where you've been, or what you've done, but who Jesus declares you to be. You matter to God. Maybe at some point somebody told you something that simply wasn't true. That you're nothing but unworthy, unwanted, and unloved. But I want the loudest voice in your ear to be the voice that breaks the cedars and shakes the wilderness. And he says, you matter to me. Before the galaxies were born or the first star gave light, before the ocean waves crashed or the night sky cracked with thunder, before any creature crawled or any bird sang, before the planets were set in motion, he set in motion the plan of your salvation. From the highest heights of heaven, the Lord of all creation, looked upon your desperation, he became like one of us to remake all of us, to make an orphan his child, to make a rebel his friend, to set the prisoner free. You matter to God. So to all the sons and daughters of God, to all my brothers and sisters in Christ, behold his power and glory and majesty. Behold the one who matters most. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Of course, James Ward here. Good morning. Great morning, God. Morning to you, friends. It's always an honor and a delight and a tremendous privilege welcoming you to Insight Church Online, or I could say Insight Church, Global Insight Church, wherever you are in the world. And I, I really do mean that. You know, this past Sunday uh, at our Tinley Park campus, I ran into an amazing family, a beautiful family, and it seems the father uh, travels to South Africa quite a bit. And he told me, Pastor, I travel a lot and I am keeping up with everything that you're teaching through social media, through the online church. I am connected and I am informed and I am part of what God is doing 
at Insight Church. And that really, really blessed me, friends, to see that God has enabled us to utilize technology that we can build Insight Church online, the Insight Church tribe, anywhere in the world, friends. We can maintain intimacy and connectivity uh, virtually, friends, through the use of technology. So thank you so much. I really mean it for you being a part of Insight Church Online. We want to hear from you. Uh, get involved. Get engaged with the chat. Send us an email and uh, let us know how you're doing. Uh, you matter to us. We're praying for you wherever you are, and we're grateful for the Insight Church tribe, friends. We like to say here at Insight Church, we are all in. We're committed 100% to the mission and the vision that God has given us here at Insight Church, friends, of, uh, to make and train followers of Jesus Christ and build strong families uh, by understanding, embracing, and doing God's word and preparing people for the day of the Lord, friends. That's the time in which we live, and it's an exciting time. I feel that we are graced, we're energized. The Lord's hand is with us, and uh, I believe the best is yet to come for you and me and for our church and for all of God's people. Not just saying that, but Jesus uh, is revealed to us in Scripture as high priest, as our high priest of good things to come. That's certainly something for us to be excited and to be hopeful about. Welcome to church today. And please do, friends, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, make sure you like and share today's service and every week, friends, with your friends, your uh, co-workers, your family members, you'll be amazed at what God can do when the gospel is preached and people encounter the word of God. We believe that more and more lives will be changed and people will be turned from the power of Satan unto God. You know, I want to encourage you to really open your heart and to prepare to receive today's message, friends. It's so powerful. You're going to hear today uh, the message that I taught on Easter Sunday, uh, a message called uh, Love Conquered for Me to Reign in Life. Part of our Easter trilogy, I started on Palm Sunday teaching that uh, love came to my rescue. Good Friday, uh, I taught that love died for my redemption. And this particular message that you're going to hear today, friends, something happened in our services. It's something happened in my own heart uh, to to understand what it means to walk in the grace of God and to reign in life through the grace of God. And uh, it's something that I believe this message in particular is going to be life changing to you. Every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Every day is Resurrection Day in the kingdom of God because we are actively walking in the life giving power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God, the power of God. And so I just want to encourage you, friends, to prepare your heart right now for the good seed of the word of God. Before we get into the scriptures and the teaching today, this is our time to give. I said a few moments ago, we are all in. Giving here at Insight Church is never an obligation. It's always an opportunity just because we love the Lord. We love his word. We love people. We love helping people. We love preaching the word to see lives change, to see families change, friends. We give with a heart of gratitude, uh, but also a sense of duty, spiritual worship, our act of spiritual worship unto the Lord by bringing our tithe and our offering before the Lord to honor him. Friends, let's do that right now. The gospel needs to continue to go forth. You can invest in the vision and the mission of Insight Church by scanning the QR code you see there, texting to give, visiting our website at insightchurch.org. Again, you can give from anywhere in the world. Make sure you download our church app. You can give on your church app and stay connected with all the great things that are happening here in the church as well. Or, of course, you can mail your support to our office in Tinley Park at any time. We're so grateful for you. We love you, friends. Uh, we're amazed at what we can do together when each of us, uh, when we all do our part, as Ephesians 4 uh, tells us that every joint supplies, every part does its share. We believe that here at Insight Church. Well, get ready. Now is the time, as I always, always like to say, to declare your heart to be good soil for the seed of God's word, because it's the quality of the soil of your heart that determines the productivity of the seed of God's word. Take a look at this. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. 
Oh, how we love your law. It is our meditation all the day. And you, through your commandments, you make us wiser than our enemies. We ask you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that the entrance of your word gives light and gives understanding to the simple. We ask that you will open the eyes of our understanding that we may comprehend your word, your purposes, and the times in which we live. Holy Spirit, we honor you. You are the spirit of God, our helper, our teacher, our comforter, the one who is called alongside us in this life and gives us the advantage in life. You are the spirit of truth whom the world cannot see and does not know, but we see you and we know you because you are not only with us, but you're in us. And we ask you this morning that you would increasingly form within each one of us the character of our Lord Jesus Christ and that you would bring about the reality of his kingdom in our lives and through our lives to the world around us. In Jesus' name, everybody intently and skulky wholeheartedly say it in the Greek. Okay. All right. Well, let's get into the word of God here on this culturally, yes, Easter Sunday, but uh, more specifically as believers, we say this resurrection day, this resurrection day. And uh, we've been teaching a, a series here, this what, what I call the Easter Trilogy on Palm Sunday. A week ago, uh, we taught on love came to my rescue. We talked about Jesus's entrance into Jerusalem. For those of you who have gone to Israel with us, when we come down the Mount of Olives, that pathway that we take, that is the exact path, exact path that Jesus took on his way up to the city of Jerusalem. So we taught last week, love came to my rescue. This past Good Friday, we had an amazing service, and we taught, secondly, love died for my redemption. Number one, love came to my rescue. Number two, love died for my redemption. Say that with me. Say, love came to my rescue. Love came to my rescue. And say, love died for my redemption. Love died for my redemption. Something that no other human could ever do or would ever do for you. That's an amazing thing. That's why we worship him. And today we're going to wrap up that series with the third part, love conquered for me to reign. Love conquered for me to reign in life. Love came to my rescue. Love died for my redemption. And today, love conquered for me to reign. Uh, my aim for this series is to help us, um, again, to more deeply appreciate the grace of God, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. We need the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And to also appreciate the gift of God's Son, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to appreciate what God has done for us. We also want to live holy in what I call um, a an a-religious, irreligious, and sacrilegious world. A-religious means um, not religious. Uh, irreligious means hostile toward religious things. And sacrilegious means disrespectful toward religious things. That's what that proclamation was. It's sacrilegious. It's disrespectful to religious things. Um, you know, very briefly, let me, let me just kind of explain here um, there's, a, there's an important distinction between uh, re being religious and religion. Religi religious is an adjective that describes devout people. Devout people. That's what it means to be religious. Religion is a noun. Religious is an adjective that describes. Religion is a noun. It's a, it's a system or an order of religion with rules. Think of a monastery with monks. That's religion. It's a system. We're, we're called to be religious, but not to subscribe to religion. Jesus came to free us from religion, but we are indeed religious people. We're devout people. We're spiritual people. We're religious. We're not called to religion, but we're religious or we're devout because God has called us into relationship with him. And when you discover relationship with the Lord, you don't need necessarily religion. The only thing that you need is the word of God for which you will find a personal relationship with Jesus in this book because he is the eternal word of God. By studying the scriptures, it will always bring you to relationship and not religion, but you are to be a religious person. Does that help anybody this morning? Very, very important. That's very uh, important again in an a-religious, irreligious, and sacrilegious world. More and more society will make mockery of the things of God. It's happening all, already, and we need to know who we are 
to be bold and to be confident and to teach our children and our grandchildren, as I often say, this is who we are, this is what we do, people like us do things like this. And to be unashamed about it, to be in the world, but separate from the world. John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for his people, prayed for us even then, and says, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. I don't pray that you take them out of the world, leave them in the world, but just keep them separate from the world's system. Make sure that the world never has them so that you can use them to be agents of change and transformation in the world by being separate. The moment we mix with the world is the moment we lose our power and authority to bring any kind of change in society. You can't deliver anybody or anything that you're subject to. And so he always calls and and is always beckoning for us to be set apart and holy to the things of God. Somebody say amen. Amen. All right. So just in Christianity overall, it's sometimes necessary. I want to kind of take us on a journey here. Sometimes necessary uh, to to feel bad before you feel good. Sometimes you got to feel bad before you feel good. Some people never feel good because they're unwilling to feel bad to deal with things that need to be dealt with. The formula that Jesus gives us when he began to preach is repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. He did not just go straight to believe the gospel. Before believing the gospel, he says, repent. You need to turn from some other thoughts. That means to do a 180 degree turn. You were going this way. Repent first means to go this way. Jesus says, change your heart, change your mind, change your thinking, change your perspective, give up your opinions, repent, and then you can believe the gospel. Because if you try to believe the gospel when you're not willing to repent, you will mix the word of God with all kinds of human ideologies, and it'll, see, it'll make, the, make the word of God ineffective in your life. So the word of God has to follow. Faith in God's word have to follow, uh, has to follow repentance. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. You know, the, the darkness has to be dispelled for the light to shine the way that it should. And that requires humility and honesty. Isn't that true? That these are the times that I want to encourage us as we're preaching today, that it's, it's, it's time for us to practice humility in our, own, in our own lives, to give up pride, but then for us to be honest about who we are and where we are. There's, there's no liar worse than you. There's, 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 the worst kind of liar is you. When you lie to yourself, about who you are and not being right with God and what you should be doing and you're you're pretending you're doing what you should be doing. There's no worse liar than a person who is deceived who lies to themselves. And so it takes time for us to to intentionally be humble and to be honest and to look around at the world today, man. It is time out for playing games and playing church. People are dying. This world is is disintegrating. It's time for us to be humble and to be honest and to get right with God, to get right with God. Somebody say amen. You can't you can't appreciate God's salvation and his goodness. You'll never taste and see that the Lord is good. You'll never experience his blessing. You can never, ever optimize and maximize your life and even hope to reach your potential in life until you get right with God. The fear of the Lord, the Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom. Everything starts with God. And so it's a time for us to see to it that our our hearts are repentant as we enter into faith. Let's dig in here. Let's start with John chapter 10. I just want to read this. It says here, the thief, everybody say the thief. The word says, Jesus himself is speaking. He says, the thief comes, very important, the thief comes. And he says that the thief comes only in order. This is his, his, his MO in our lives. The thief comes in order to steal and kill and do what? That's the thief's job. That's his role in the life of every individual is to steal, kill and destroy from the mouth of Jesus. But then Jesus gives us the antithesis and said, I came. The thief thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. But then Jesus says, I came. Very important to note here. He's making a comparison of the thief being one who comes to steal, kill and destroy. Or the, the thief, get this, is a taker. But then Jesus says, I came because I am a giver. He uses the terminology to describe the devil of thief because thieves take things that don't belong to them. 
And he says that's the enemy's ob- objective in the lives of people is to take everything you have to still kill and destroy. But then on the contrast, in the contrast there, he says, I came as a giver. Listen at this, that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Jesus said, that's why I came, that you would have life. He wants you to enjoy your life. Somehow, some way, society has turned Jesus into the taker. As though serving Jesus is a bad thing. He's not the taker. He's the giver. And he says, I come to give you life that you would enjoy your life and that you would have it more abundantly. I can assure you and me and anybody, you have absolutely nothing Jesus needs. Why would he, why would he take anything from us? When the word in, in James chapter 1, verse 17 or what have you, tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. He doesn't need to take anything. He gave us everything. So there's, there's never a need for him to take. He's not a taker. He's a giver. And he came to give us life that we would enjoy life and we would do it more abundantly to the full until it overflows. God wants you to enjoy your life. Everybody say that with me. God wants me to enjoy my life. That's Bible. That's God's will. That's why love came to die and why love came to rescue us and redeem us so that we can have life and that we can enjoy that life. That's God's plan for every one of us, for those who are willing to receive it by by faith. You know, God wants us to enjoy our lives. He's not against us having things. He's against things having us. He's not against us being in control of things that we'll use for his glory. He's against those things having control over us. And control over our heart and our mind and our time. And we have them so much that we're too busy for church because the house he gave me is such a nice house. I don't even have time to come to church anymore. That's not why he gave you the house to keep you away from him. So as long as we have things, that's fine as long as things don't have us. As we don't put anything in front of him, seek first, Jesus said, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God will continue to bless you so that you can enjoy your life. We have a good father in heaven. Somebody say amen. Amen. So again, the thief comes or the devil to steal, kill and destroy the work of the devil. He's still when he steals, kills and destroys. Think about this just in the world today. Mental health issues, sickness and disease, depression, loneliness, suicide, adultery, fornication, all kinds of immorality, lying, terrorism, fear, hatred, greed, murder. We can go on and on and on. All of those are the work of the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy that we see operating in the lives of people. And without Christ in people's lives, you mostly see the work of the devil in their lives. Wherever Christ is not Lord in a person's life, you mostly see tremendous fruit of the devil's work or the thief working in their life with all of the kind of things that I just read here. It becomes natural. It just kind of becomes a way, a way of life. You know, look around at the, at the world again. It's time to, to give our hearts to Jesus, to the one who came to give us life and to give us life more abundantly. Things will not get better in society. They will only get worse. We need relationship with Christ now, the one who came for us to enjoy our life. In contrast to what's happening in the world, world, we serve a covenant-keeping God who will always take care of his people. And Jesus said, if you being evil will take care of your children, how much more will your heavenly father take care of his people? God is a whole lot better to me and to you than I could ever be to Jonathan and Hannah. He only wants the best for his people. Somebody say amen. You know, we ask the question sometimes, well, if God is good, how come bad things happen in the world? How come there are so many problems in the world? Well, the answer is simple and can be seen in our own lives. People don't listen to God just like we don't listen to God. That's why bad things happen in the world. It has nothing to do with the goodness of God. It's people don't listen. People don't obey him. They don't do what he said the way he said to do it. And so it creates a, a whole lot of problems that we have to deal with. And it gives license for the thief to work. To still kill and destroy. I'm amazed, man. People are always complaining about getting God out of government. Nobody talks about getting the devil out of the government. No, I mean, it's like, at least be even handed. 
at least say get God and the devil out, but it's always get God out of government. Nobody ever wants to get the devil out of government. He's in the government, which is why they don't want God in the government, because God's the only one that can get him out of the government. Come on, folks. This is where we're living today. This is where we're living today. Let's go here. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Tells us this, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world. I said we got to feel bad before we can feel good, and we got to talk about the problem in the world here. When we say that love conquered, we're going to see what he conquered. We're going to see what he overcame on your behalf and on my behalf. So Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world. It's amazing. One man, it only takes one person to mess up everything. <laughs> one man. Through one man, sin entered the world. And then it says here, there's a consequence. Along with sin, death came through sin. And now here's a greater problem. And, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. You now have an exponentially growing problem in the world because sin came in through one man, one man, death came in through sin, and then sin began to spread. Death spread to all men because all sin. That's how the thief works. Let's just say it this way. When, when sin creates a crack, death comes through the crack. If, if sin gets established, if you, if you ever give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. Think about this. Every stronghold starts with a foothold. Every stronghold starts with a foothold. If you, if you give the devil a, a spot, he'll take a nation. He'll take a nation. Death spread through sin, and it's always something that it, it functions like a catalyst. It's, it, it multiplies. It's exponential. Wickedness and sin is exponential in life, which is why the Bible says give no place to the devil. Don't give him a spot. Don't give him an inch. Don't give him a millimeter. Give no place to the devil at all. Because wherever sin opens a crack, death is going to come through. And it's something that we can't stop it, that we're helpless. And it actually begins to corrupt our entire lives. And so we see that Adam, you know, I say here he removed God and God's word from their rightful place in his life. And then everything in his life and everything in the world around him fell apart. He opened, opened the way. He did not keep God and God's word in their rightful place in his life. And then his life fell apart and everything in the world around him fell apart. It started, you really begin to see it, see that even with his own children. Take a look at this. Look with me at Genesis chapter seven, verse chapter four, verse seven. Talks about Adam's first son, Cain, and his younger brother, Abel. You know the story that Cain killed his brother, Abel. That's sin that brought death through that, through that crack, and it began to multiply so that his firstborn son murdered his secondborn son. It's the first mention of sin, the first murder recorded in the Bible. Sent after, after Adam disobeyed God, you see the first sin and the first murder in the Bible from Adam's own children. What a crisis. It says here in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, God is speaking here to Cain, and he tells him, if you do well, if you obey God and serve God and, you know, be obedient to the truth of God's word, if you do well, he tells him, asks him the question, will you not be accepted? But listen, and if you do not do well, God tells him, sin lies at the door, and its desire there's a personification now of sin. God tells them if you don't do well, if you disobey, if you disregard God's word, disregard God's word, God tells them, in the, it, wasn't it even gracious for God to even tell him that? That's the mercy of God already at work to point out to him what the enemy was wanting to do. And God tells him in his mercy, he says, listen, sin is lying at your door and his desire is for you. It wants to devour you, but he tells them, you shall rule over it. Don't let it rule over you. You must rule over sin. It's at your door. It's lying there in its desire for you. I'm going to come back to that. Take a look with me at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 from the Amplified Bible. Peter writes about this. 
years and years later, he says, be well, balanced, be temperate, sober of mind, be vigilant and cautious at all times for that enemy of yours, the thief, for that enemy of yours, the devil roams about like a lion roaring in fierce hunger. Remember God tells Cain that, that its desire is for you, that sin has an appetite to devour you. It's lusting after you. It, it has a hunger and a desire to destroy your life. Peter picks up on the same thing by the same Holy Spirit years and years later and saying that the enemy, the devil, is like a lion who's roaring in fierce hunger with an, with an appetite to destroy people, seeking someone to seize upon and to devour. Makes it very plain. And the reason these two passages are connected when Peter talks about sin, uh, Satan being like a roaring lion, when you go back to Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, when God tells Cain, sin lies at your door, that word lies in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, it's a word that literally means crouching on four legs like a predator. That's what that word in the Hebrew means. Sin lies at your door. Sin is crouching at your door like a four-legged animal stalking its prey, waiting to pounce to devour you. That was the message. I like nature shows, but sometimes they're gruesome. <laughs> sometimes they're gruesome, man. When you look and you see lions, hyenas, jackals, wild dogs are the worst. They're just... When you see them devour animals and eat some of them alive, it's brutal. And that's the picture that God gives us about sin crouching at your door, looking to devour you, to eat you and your family alive, to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the picture that he gives us here. Somebody say amen. amen. Very important here. You, you read all of that, an interesting note. We won't go there, but it's interesting when, when Isaiah prophesies about Jesus coming as the Prince of Peace. Isaiah prophesies this. You remember I just tell you about animals eating each other and how they just, I mean, it's gory. They eat each other alive. But Jesus, Jesus Isaiah prophesies that when the Messiah comes and he sets up his reign, he tells us this. He says the time is going to come under Jesus' leadership when the lion and the lamb are going to lie, lie down together and become friends. He says, that's what's going to happen when the prince of peace begins to rule. Read the word of God. Isaiah says lions are going to become vegetarians. And they're going to become best buddies with the animals they used to eat. Don't we need that in America right now? <laughs> that's what happens when the prince of peace comes. He goes on to say that, that a little kid will be able to play with the cobras and the cobras won't bite because peace is ruling and peace is reigning. That's what Jesus does. And if he can do that in the creation, imagine what he can do in your mind and in your heart, man. You're dealing with depression and anxiety and you can't sleep at night and you're dealing with all kinds of pressure and you're just under stress and duress, man. The Prince of Peace can settle things in your life to give you what the Bible calls the peace that surpasses all understanding it will guard your heart like a soldier on duty until the day that Jesus Christ comes. He will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is committed and stayed upon him. That's a part of love conquering for you to reign in life, for us to be people who walk in tremendous peace. Somebody say amen. amen. So we'll read there. Take a look at this with me. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. 1 John 1, 8. Tells us this, if we say that we have no sin, if we say that we have no sin, it tells us plainly here that we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Speaking to every one of us, verse 9. But watch, watch the grace of God here. It says, but if we, if we just confess our sins, Remember I talked before about humility and honesty? Yes. Now, if we say we have no sin, the Bible says you're a liar, you're a deceiver, the truth is not even in you. But if you would just confess it, just acknowledge it, and just come to God with humility and honesty and say, Lord, yes, I'm it. I did it. 
I'm not right. I want to be right. I can't get right. I need you to help me get right. If you, if you just do that, watch this. Here's the promise. If you confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, watch this, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The moment we acknowledge it, God says, I'll take care of it. Now, usually we don't come to him to confess our sins because we think we got to get right. Come on, folks. We think we got to get it together before we come to God. We can't get it together and then come to God. When you come to God, he'll get it together for you when you confess it. So there are no qualifications. There are no standards other than just saying, God, I just want to be honest and acknowledge it. This is a problem. And the moment you say it's a problem, God says, I'll take care of that. I'll take care of that. I can handle it. And you'll hear Jesus telling you really by the spirit. That's why I die. That's why I die. Lord, you don't know how bad or what I did. That's why I died. Well, you don't know who I did it with, and you know what kind of a person I was. Yeah, I do. I created you. I, that's why I died. That's why I died. If you just confess it. If you're just honest and humble enough to confess it, he says, I'll forgive it. I'll cleanse you. I'll cleanse you. I'll cleanse you. I'll cleanse your conscience and take away the guilt. I'll take away the regret. You know, you know regret is a dog and I'm telling you, even long after you get saved and you are serving God, sometimes guilt and regret for things you did 10 or 15 years ago, that thing will come on you and you constantly need the Lord speaking to you to say that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. That's why I die. That's why I die. That's why I die. And that peace begins to rule in your heart. Somebody say, man. He tells us here he would cleanse us. Verse 10, if we say again that we have not sinned, let me say it this way. Well, I'm a good person. Well, I'm a good person. I try to help people. That means nothing. That means nothing. I'm a good person. No, if, if, if you confess your sin, I'm not a good person. I want to be a good person. And Jesus can make me the good person. That's confessing your sin. That's confessing your sin. But he says that, that if we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. Friends, it is so easy. It's a complex process on God's behalf, but it is so easy to get right with God. All you got to do is be honest and humble yourself and confess it. And God says, I will take care of it. I would take care of you. I don't care if you've been divorced 16 times. I don't care if you got, let me get real. I don't care if you got 13 children by eight different women. I don't care if you were in prison. I don't care if you have a record. I don't care if you have a felony. I don't care if you've had an abortion. I don't care if you were an alcoholic. I don't care if you stole something. I don't care what you did. The blood of Jesus and his sacrifice is sufficient for you and he will cleanse you from it. He will cleanse you from it. The word that says, if any man or any woman is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away and all things have become brand new. And the word of God still stands today. Still stands. It's the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy that wants to steal and rob your purpose from you. And wants to tell you you can't recover and you can't go on and you can't ever be anything and you can't move forward. It's the thief that tells you that. When Jesus says, I come to give you life, I come to give you life to the full in abundance until it overflows. And he can save anybody from anything and take them to the very highest. The word of God says that he saves to the uttermost those that come to God through him. He's able to save to the uttermost. Somebody say amen. amen. This is all included in the fact that love conquered. He conquered, and we're going to see, for me to reign in life. He conquered for me to reign. Somebody say amen. amen. Come on, do yourself a favor, man. And just today is the day just for us to be honest and say, I need Jesus. I just need Jesus. I need the Lord. I just need the Lord. This today is the day for every single one of us to say, I just need the Lord. I need him. And if you have him, I need him some more. <laughs> That's what Resurrection Day is all about. It's, it's a day for us to say we need the Lord. 
not a proclamation to acknowledge anybody's gender. It's a day that America should be saying we need the Lord, Mr. President. One day, just one day to get America to call on God to say in God we trust, one nation still under God. We just need one day to be able to say that. And God says, he can do it for America. I will cleanse you of your sin. I'll heal the land. God made a promise. I'll heal the land. If we're just humble enough and honest enough to come before the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. God help us. First Corinthians 15, 56. Let's keep going here. Let me explain this. We talked about sin and how death comes through sin. First Corinthians 15, 56 says this. It says the sting of death is sin. Very important statement. The strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin is the law. I want to explain that. Here in Tinley, in Skokie, hear me. This, this, this verse of scripture right here, the strength of sin is the law. In other words, you can't solve a problem that you are unwilling to acknowledge its existence. You, gotta, you first got to acknowledge the thing if you're ever going to get free from it, if you're ever going to have victory, you have to acknowledge it. And so when the word says that the strength of sin is the law, the law, which is the word of God, what it does, it takes, let me explain it this way, something that is disastrous. Remember I said if you give the enemy a millimeter, he'll take a light year. So in other words, if it, if it shows up, if it's small enough, you will overlook it. So let's just say you might be able to see it under a magnifying glass or, or under a microscope is that small that some things are not visible to the, to the naked eye. Well, the word of God, when it says that the strength of sin is the law, the word of God works like a magnifying glass to put it on that thing so that it looks bigger for you to say, whoa, I didn't see that before from God's perspective. Because the moment you see it, then you can repent from it and confess it, and then you can be forgiven, and then you can be cleansed. But you can't confess something that you don't know is there. So the word is like a magnifying glass or a microscope for it to show up. And once it shows up, then God can deal with it. And when God deals with it, you can get rid of it. And when you get rid of it, then you can reign and begin to walk out your purpose and live for God. And so the Bible, the law, it strengthens sin until it gets big enough that it can be dealt with. I'll, I'll give you a, a short analogy. It's, it's why the state posts speed limits signs all over. They put up speed limit signs, 65 miles an hour, 30, whatever. You know why, you know why they put them signs up? They're anticipating you standing in front of the judge. They're, they're anticipating... When you stand before the judge, they're going to be able to say you broke the law because we put the law up that told you you were only supposed to be doing 45. And when you stand in front of the judge, the speed limit sign is going to testify against you that you're guilty. And that's the word of God is there to help us understand we've broken the law. There's something wrong that needs to be fixed. The strength of sin is the law. It helps us acknowledge there's a problem but there's not a problem because if we just confess it. Now, if we say we don't have it, you're a liar, you're a deceiver, the truth is not in you. But if you just say, whoa, the sin has been magnified, I see it, God, I confess it, it's there. God says, I'll take care of it. I'll forgive you and I'll cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Somebody say amen. amen. That's the beauty of the word of God is it shows you the imperfections. It shows you the infractions so that you can be washed and be clean and you can grow and be perfected and become better and you grow in the image and the likeness. You become more and more like God. As Peter says, you become partakers of his divine promises. You become partakers of his divine nature through these exceedingly great and precious promises. You become partakers of his divine nature that God begins to make you more and more and more and more like him. Hallelujah. But it only comes through his word that strengthens sin so that we can confess those things and be changed. Somebody say amen. amen. What a tremendous blessing. Look at this principle here. The law or God's holy word, which is the Bible, was given to us to reveal sin, 
to strengthen our awareness of sin in our own lives and to consciously build within us a desperate need for its removal. A desperate need for its removal. You've heard me say before, the only devil that you can't cast out is a tolerated devil. The only thing you can't get victory over is something you tolerate. If you coddle it, you tolerate it, you won't acknowledge it, and you feed it, you can't get rid of that. The only kind of devil you can't get rid of is something that you tolerate. But the word of God here is to show us the, a desperate need for its removal to say that thing needs to go. That has to change in me so that I can grow in the likeness of God. Somebody say amen. amen. To help us say I need to get rid of it and I need a savior. I need some help. Let's look at that from the word. Romans chapter 7 verse 23. Romans 7 23 from the New Living Translation. Paul writes this. I love this passage. He says, but there is another power within me. Isn't that interesting? Now, this is him, not Saul. He's already Paul. He'd already met Jesus on the Damascus Road. He'd already been filled with the Holy Spirit and was already one of the greatest New Testament apostles that the world has ever seen. And even after giving his life to Jesus, Paul is still having this conversation. He said there is. He didn't say there was. He said, there is another power within me. That's true for every one of us in here, that until we go to be with the Lord, for those who have confessed, in Jesus, confessed faith in Jesus Christ, and we spend time with him in eternity, for those, for any of us here in this world, until that time come, comes, there's something on the inside of us, let's just call it the seed of sin, and it's working. I can, I can, I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter if you're a preacher or bishop or whatever. It doesn't matter. Sometimes some weird stuff come out of nowhere. And I'm like, where did that come from? How did, I, how, did I, how did that get in my mind? Am I the only one? Can anybody raise a hand and tell the truth? Like some, some, sometimes just some weird stuff comes into your mind. We won't, we won't get to it. The Bible, the Bible says that when, when Satan had entered Judas... And Jesus, Jesus tells Peter, when he tells him, get thee behind me, Satan, he says, you are not mindful of the things of God. Satan, Satan will put things in people's minds. He can suggest certain things. And Paul, Paul makes this statement. He says, there's another power. Everybody say power. power. Power means now you need a greater power to deal with it. He says, there's another power within me. Very important, that is at war with my mind. Whatever this thing is, that thing is like, it's like World War Three, Four, Five, Six, Seven all the time. It's warring with my mind. The power, this power, it makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. He was already an apostle, already planting churches, already writing letters. But he says that, there's something, as long as I'm on this earth, he says, there's still something in me, this power that's at war with my mind. He was already a Christian. Verse 24, listen, listen at him being humble and being honest. Watch this. Verse 24, Paul says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Now, he wasn't being self-defeatist. He was being honest about that thing. Some translation says, oh, wretched man that I am. You know, we sing the song that saved a wretch like me. He's an old wretched man that I am. He says, I'm a miserable man. But listen to this. Here's the good part. He says, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? It's in me. It's working. I can't get free. It's still there. Verse 25. Thank God. He tells us here, the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, that's how I deal with that thing on the inside of me. He says, the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, he says here, I am a slave to sin. He said, the answer is Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's how I conquer. That's how I live in victory over this thing that's in me and certainly is around me. He says, that's how I do it. I need a savior. 
I, I need a savior. Before I've given my life to Jesus and after I've given my life to Jesus, I need a savior. Every minute of the day, every moment of the day, I can't go a second without Jesus and his presence in my life or any of us, we're capable of some crazy stuff. We need Jesus all the time. Somebody say amen. amen. He continues in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. He says, but thanks be to God again. He said, thanks God. Thank God before here. He says, thanks be to God. You know, if you're relatively new to church, you might be saying, man, why, why do you come to church? And for 40 something minutes here in Skokie, we, they're standing up. They're singing all these songs. They're lifting their hands. Some people are jumping up and down. Some people are clapping. Some people are weeping. Why are they standing up for 30, 40 minutes singing these songs, talking to God, talking to Jesus? I'll tell you why. We're saying thanks be to God. That's all we're doing. The Bible says enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. Before for you to even approach God, the Bible says you have to have an attitude of gratitude that you just, Lord, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Come, come near to God. We're thankful. So we, we start the service just with time, just to say, you know what? We're just thanking God. We're not asking for stuff. We're not telling God all the stuff we need, how many bills we need paid, and what kind of problems we need to solve, and what we need to do with him. We're just coming to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you. Thank you for dealing with sin in my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for taking me from being a drug addict to being free. Thank you that I used to be an alcoholic, but now I'm sober. Lord, I used to be immoral, but now you've made me a man and a woman of purity, Lord. I used to be a gambler, spending all the family's money, but you broke that. Now I'm free. It's just coming to say thank you, God, because he deals with that power that's working within us. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the name of the Lord. He gives us victory. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're, we're singing songs of thanksgiving to him for his deliverance. I mean, don't, don't judge. Even, even, even the munchkins sang a song, ding dong, the wicked witch is dead. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean when, when, the, when the enemy has been broken and you're free, you're singing, even the munchkins sang. So why wouldn't we sing, thank God, praise the Lord, Lord, I love you. We give you glory and praise <laughs> because that's what thankful and free people do. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> Putting God back in his rightful place in our lives, God and his word. You know, I said before that, you know, everything fell apart in Adam's life when God and his word was no longer in their rightful place. Very quickly, Jeremiah chapter 12 tells us that even, even creation in the world is suffering because of sin in the lives of people. Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 4 says, how long will the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither? The beasts and the birds are consumed. Here's the reason. For the wickedness of those who dwell there, because they said he will not see our final end. It's the wickedness of the people that was causing the land and all the creation to suffer. The people in their disobedience. Isaiah chapter 24 verse 6 says, says the same thing. It says the earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes. The world is suffering and fades away. The haughty people, the prideful people of the earth languish. Verse 5, the earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. Again, because... They have transgressed the laws of God's word, changed the ordinance, changed his instructions, and broken the everlasting covenant with God. Therefore, verse 6, big deal. The curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabit inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. says that the curse has been unleashed because of people's disobedience to God. One man, through one man, sin entered the world. And death spread to all men because all sin, the curse comes whenever our lives are not in right alignment with God. And it's something none of us can, can escape. But then there's the good news. Let's see how love conquered. Let's see what Jesus did to free us from the curse and to bring us in the blessing. Listen, God is love. We need to know that God is love. And he sent his son, Jesus, to save us because he loved us. Isn't that amazing? 
that God in his person is love and he sent his son Jesus because he loved us. He sent his son Jesus to save us from sin and from death and from the curse and from the world mourning and languishing. Because God is love, he loved us and sent his son out of that love to save us. To save us. Remember, Jesus tells us, it's the thief that comes to make you miserable, to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came to give you life so that you can enjoy to the full until it overflows. Never let the enemy or society suggest to you that Jesus comes to make your life miserable. He does not. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That term rest in the Greek means I will give you a vacation in your spirit. I will put you on vacation in your soul. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. He's the giver so that we can enjoy life. And so because God is love, he sent his son, Jesus, because he loved us. First John chapter four, verse eight tells us here. He who does not love does not know God for God is what God is what? Say that with me. God is love. God is love. He is. That's, in, that's the only hope we have of anything pure in the world anymore is to know that God is love. That's all we have, folks, is to know that God is love. It comes, it comes again here in 1 John 4, 16, and we have known, very important, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. So it's not just enough for God to be love. We have to know it and we have to believe that he is love. And we have to believe the love that he has for us. Or you could say, you must know and believe the love that God has for you. Everybody just say, God loves me. It's one of the greatest truths you could ever speak, whether you feel like it or not, whether your parents were there or not, whether you've been abandoned, rejected, abused, ostracized, discriminated against, the greatest truth that you can uh, even entertain and possibly contemplate about yourself is that God loves me. He loves you. That's why he sent his son. That's why he sent his son, because he loves you. But we must know and believe the love that God has for me. I can tell you, and maybe we'll come back to this at a later time, The moment you begin to really, really, really believe that God loves you and because he loves you, there's nothing that he will withhold from you. And because he loves you, there's nothing he won't do for you. Paul says it this way. If he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? That if he gave you Jesus on the cross because he loved you, he'll, he'll do anything and everything else for you. But you got to know and believe that he loves you. It's the most powerful thing in the life of any individual is to fully walk in the love of God. No more, no more self-esteem issues. You talk about confidence. You talk about boldness. You talk about fearlessness. Man, when you get to know God loves you, you begin to know there's nothing I can't do. There's nothing I can't do. Watch this. Love conquered. Love conquered. Somebody say amen. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. That's right. That's worth clapping. He makes it plain here. We know this. John 3.16. A couple more here. It says, for God, we know this one. So God so loved the world that he gave. Again, God is never a taker. Never, ever, ever, ever taker. God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten son, that whoever, anybody, everybody who believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, big deal. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Remember how society makes us think like Jesus is the bad guy? God God didn't send Jesus here to condemn the world. You you know, if Jesus, if he wanted to, he could have came to this earth and just slammed everybody. (laughs) If, if he wanted to come and just beat people up, he could have came and just like 
destroyed everybody and tore everything up. But the word says God did not send him to bring the world into condemnation. He didn't send Jesus here to destroy anything. He didn't, he didn't send him here to bring condemnation, to condemn the world. But on the contrast, he sent them here that the world, everybody say through him. through him. Not apart from him, not around him, not beside him. There's no other way. It's through him that the world might be saved. There's no other way to be saved. No other way that the world through him might be saved. Democrats, Republicans, Buddhists, atheists, agnostics, you name it, Confucianists, Hindus, come on. The, I'm going, I'm going to stick with the word that says everybody through him might be saved. Yeah. Buddha can't make you that promise. Yeah. Vishnu can't make you that promise. You can't read that in the Bhagavad Gita. That's got to come from the holy scriptures of God that God has, has, has exalted even above his own name. I'll stick with the promise of God's word that through him the world might be saved. Are you with me? Yes. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. If we say we have no sin, you're a liar. You deceive yourself. The truth is not in you. But if we just confess our need, God says, I forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Somebody say, man, our sins have offended God. And we all need his grace. Every single one of us. Isaiah 53, 6. Look at a few more here. Isaiah 53, 6 says this. All we, everybody say all we. All we, all we like sheep have gone what? Does that include everybody? Yes. Now, if you say you have no sin, the Bible says you're a liar. Yes. I haven't gone astray. I'm a good person. Yes, you have. Don't be a liar. <laughs> we've, all, we've all gone astray. Our will, our rights, our opinions, our feelings, our politics, leading people astray. We've all gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, pridefully and selfishly, his own way, not God's own way. But then it says here, but the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. In other words, the punishment for all of that rebellion and going our own way, God put it all on Jesus on the cross. That's why we celebrate Good Friday. Because he put all of our iniquity and all of our wrongdoing and all of the punishment that we rightfully deserve was on Jesus on the cross. The good news is that even when we go astray, Jesus says, I got something for that. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. If you just confess it, the good shepherd knows how to just bring you back over so that you're not astray anymore. That's, you, you can't wander off too far that the good shepherd won't come and get you. Remember Jesus says, he tells the parable that he'll leave the 99 sheep to go find that one sheep. You're the one sheep. You're the one sheep. You're it. And he says, that's what the good shepherd do. I will leave the 99 that are doing okay. I'm going to go find that one sheep that keeps on straying off because I'm the good shepherd. I'm going to keep on bringing them back. Keep on bringing them back. That's what we're here. That's what we're here for today. Each each week, he just keeps bringing us back, and we come to church, and I feel like, man, my life has been brought back in alignment. My life has been brought back in alignment. Romans chapter three, verse twenty-three from the Amplified Bible says again: Since all have sinned and are falling short of the honor and glory which God bestows and receives, it talks to us about that all have sinned and falling falling short. So we have to ask the question: How can we be made right with God? All have sinned. I, I was looking. I don't follow pop culture too much, so I don't even know who's popular right now. I just I don't even know. So I had to look and find out. And when the Bible says all have sinned, you know, great guy, I guess. Cristiano Ronaldo is the world's most followed individual on Instagram. World famous soccer player. 626 million people are following him on Instagram. I, I can go down the list, just names, you know, Rihanna, Selena Gomez, Kylie Jenner, Beyonce, Taylor Swift, Jay-Z, J-Lo, Kanye, LeBron James, Meghan Markle, Kim Kardashian, James Ward, Lavelle Griffin. 
<laughs> Sharon, Ward, Hannah. When the Bible says all, it's all. I sometimes, we, we pray for celebrities, I sometimes wonder if they have ever met a real Christian that they can point to and meet who doesn't want an ad- autograph that they can look at that Christian and say, you are far wealthier than I am. All, all have gone astray. We've all sinned. Everybody is in need of, of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Romans 3.24 Tells us the contrast, but then all are justified. All of sin, but now here's the antithesis. All are justified and made upright and in right standing with God freely and gratuitously by his grace, his unmerited favor and his mercy. Here it is. Through the redemption which is provided in who? Every person in the world needs the redemption that only comes through Jesus Christ. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly. God's word teaches us how to live and tells us we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, who? Jesus over and over again, verse 14, who gave himself for who? Us. For us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself, big deal, his own special people. That's what he's working to do, to purify for himself his own special people who are zealous for good works. So let's talk about his own special people here. This is where we're going, to, we're going to conclude when I talk about love conquered for me to reign in life. That's only for the special people. <laughs> That's only for the special people. And I'm thankful I'm a special person. And for any person who's given their life fully to Jesus, you are a special person. That Jesus himself right now is in heaven. He's not taking a nap. He's not relaxing. He's in heaven right now interceding and working on your behalf because you are special to him. You are special to him. Somebody say amen. Amen. Look at Ephesians 2.8. It says here, for it is by free grace, God's unmerited favor. Everybody say favor. favor. That comes for the special people. That's what favor means. It means you're special. People treat you special when you got favor on you. When you got favor, they treat you special. When you're special, you get favor. Those two go together. So it's his grace, his unmerited favor. It says, but you are saved and made partakers of Christ's salvation through your faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves. It's not of your own doing. It came not through your own striving. Don't we strive a lot in life? We're just kind of... He said, you don't, have, you don't have to strive. It's not through your own striving, but it is the gift. Everybody say gift. Yeah. It's the gift of God. His grace, his salvation, it's just the gift of God to be, rece- to be received. Verse 9, not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast. It is not the result of what anyone can possibly do, so no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. It's just the gift that God gives us. He gives us the gift of his grace. And if that was not enough, James 4, 6 tells us this, but he gives us more and more grace, more and more favor, more and more of God's grace. That's what happens when you become special to him so that you can enjoy life to the full until it overflows because you're special, you're special and God's favor is coming to you more and more and more, and more, and more, and more, and more, and more. Every day you wake up, a fresh batch of God's grace is coming your way. That's what he does for his special people. Somebody say amen. Amen. But it's something that we have to invite him in our hearts to do. The grace of God, it transforms what I call criminals against God who reign into children of God who reign as kings and queens on earth. We're going to end here. The grace of God 
transforms criminals against God. Remember all that law, that sin, all that sin, all have gone astray? That's crime against God. But the grace of God transforms criminals against God into children of God. And they reign as kings and queens on earth. Take a look at Romans 5, 17. For if because of one man's trespass, we talked about that, lapse in his offense, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace, his unmerited favor again, and the free gift again of righteousness, putting them into right standing with God himself, says that those people will reign as kings in life through the one man who? The Messiah and the anointed one. They will reign in life through one man who is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. You ever get tired of life beating you up and life ruling over you, the thief stealing, killing, and destroying you, being dominated? says that through the one man, Jesus Christ, and by the grace of God, he will cause you to reign in life. Revelation 1, 6, it says that Jesus formed us into a kingdom. Get this, a royal race, a royal race, special people. See, I, I don't want to stir up no mess, but listen, that's why all the, the black, white racism stuff don't affect me. I'm a royal race. <laughs> that stuff is all beneath me, man. You, you, you get to a point, you pass that. You pass that. We're a royal race. Somebody say amen. amen. We're a royal race. Second Timothy 4, 8 tells us here, there is laid up for us, there is laid up for me, Paul says, the victor's crown of righteousness. Why? For being right with God and for doing right, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will, re will award to me. We're kings and priests, God's own special people. It says here, God has laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So I just, I just, you know, as a visual, brought my, my crown. You know, and um, when I talk about love conquered for me to reign in life, that crown of righteousness, he's made me to be a king and a priest. The word of God tells us right here that we will reign in life through Jesus Christ. When you come to faith in him, if you could see it, what Jesus does is reaches out and he placed one of these guys on your head just, just like that. And you begin to live in life, reigning in life. This is how, how heaven sees you. This is how heaven sees you. Now, in this world, to a lot of people, it looks silly for me to have this on my head. But I'm telling you, in heaven, you look silly without one. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is, this is, this is, what, this is what Jesus has done for you and I, when the word of God talks about us, us reigning in, rice, in life, he's put a crown on your head. This is how heaven sees you. And when he came out of the grave, he brought all of us out of the grave with him. And we we're all wearing crowns to reign in life. To reign in life. We're all wearing crowns. And I'm telling you, I don't care if you're from the worst parts. I don't care what conditions you're from. I don't care what happened in your home. I don't care how you grew up. I don't care what conditions you've been facing. This is how heaven sees you. And this is how God intends for you to see yourself when you come to faith through Jesus Christ. Just, just one Romans 10, 9, and then we're going to close. The word tells you, I think I'll keep my crown on for a minute. I like it. <laughs> you know, I've, I've never, you know, I don't, I've never called Le LeBron King James. That's his nickname. I've never called him LeBron King James. I don't, I don't, that don't come out of my mouth. I'm King James. <laughs> and you King JT and Queen JC, right? Come on. We're all queens and kings around here. We're his special people. This is what happened when love conquered. Romans 10, 9 simply tells us again, take a look at this, that if you confess, we read that. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll get a crown. 
you'll get a crown. That's what it means to be saved. If you confess him. But look at that last verse of scripture. Jesus says this in, in the book of Luke. He says, but whoever is ashamed of me. That's, what, that's what's happening in the world today, that so much persecution and rejection and resistance is coming toward those who are Christ followers. And Jesus says, but if you're ashamed of me and my words, it's the Bible, he says of that same person, the son of man who is Jesus would be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his father's glory and in the presence of the holy angels. Jesus says, if you don't stand up for me, he says, I'll be ashamed of you. We don't want that. But I'm telling you, when you are bold and committed to him, he is committed to you and you will reign in life through faith in Jesus Christ. I just want today as a day of, of reset, whether you know the Lord or don't know the Lord, if you've never become a Christian or if you are a Christian, today is a day simply for every single one of us to say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Well, friends, if you open your heart, friend, to receive the revelation that uh, has been given through the word of God today by the spirit of God, there's no way that you can stay the same. There's no way that your marriage and your family can stay the same. What we've heard in the word of God today, friends, I want to encourage you to not only embrace it, but if you are a parent or a grandparent, I want to encourage you to teach the word of God to your children and your grandchildren. Have them sit down to listen to this teaching. Talk about it with, with them. Discuss it with them. You know, the book of Deuteronomy tells us to do that, to sit with our children and to uh, talk often about the things of God around our dinner table. And uh, this is a time, friends, that we must see to it that we are helping not only our children, but even ourselves and every member of our family to know exactly who we are in Christ. I believe that identity crisis in this time of ideological warfare, friends, all of the movements, all of the cultural uh, challenges that we see today, the myriad of voices, most of which are demonic voices, uh, communicating things that are not true, communicating things that do not align with our values based upon the word of God. We have to see to it that we are uh, developing our identity, friends, that we know who we are and whose we are based upon what the Word of God has to say about us, friends. And as you saw in today's teaching, you are a king. You are a queen. God has made us to be a royal race and part of his royal family, his own special people. And may God help us to never compromise, friends, who we are and to never abdicate the inheritance that we have through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, Now thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Be encouraged. As always, if you missed the opportunity earlier to give, friends, don't ever miss the opportunity. Uh, anytime we can put seed in the ground to sow, we're just guaranteeing that there's a future harvest coming our way. So don't miss the opportunity to invest, to plant seed, friends. Scan the QR code there, text to give, visit our website, use your church app, mail your support however you desire to get your seed in the ground, uh, knowing that God will multiply the seed sown. Well, that's it for today. I want to speak the blessing of God over you and your family, friends, by simply saying the priestly blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Always remember, Jesus Christ, our Lord, loves you, Pastor Sharon, and I love you so much. Be well, be encouraged. I'll see you next time.